Welcome back, coaches. This is the Football Coaching Podcast. I am Daniel Chamberlain, co-host, here with Joe Daniel, as always. What's up, coach? Oh, it's the off-season, which is a bummer. The off season's I, uh, always a good time. I know, but it's like that weird holiday break where you can't really get into weightlifting. I mean, our guys are, our kids are, but I'm not sure. really the, the cool kid crew over there. Just being a freshman side, um, I have to wait for them to come back, which means we're waiting on eighth graders, which will be maybe some spring ball. I don't know if we get to bring them up or not. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how, yeah. It's been so long since I was in a program with a freshman team. Like a real freshman team? Yeah, and and the school, I was there for 12 years, but we eventually did away with the freshman level and opted for middle school. A lot of places around here now, there's not a lot of freshman ball in a lot of places, middle school, JV, varsity. Um, And then when I was in real small schools, it was just 8th and ninth graders played JV, 8th, ninth, and 10th graders can play JV uh, and varsity. And, And we would, the middle school aspect would be handled by a youth program. Right. But yeah, the school that I was at that had a freshman program when I first started coaching uh, actually had a eighth and ninth grade junior high. So it was just com- different because all the freshmen were in a different school. I don't know how. That's, that doesn't make it weird. It was more weird. If we, what was really weird was when you brought a freshman up because they're like not even on the same schedule. Yeah. I'd see how that would be a little bit difficult. I was actually having a conversation with a good buddy of mine last night, and he's at a school in Arkansas. And I had forgotten that like eighth and ninth grade is a thing. Like schools just they're eighth and ninth to play together, and mm-hmm. because it's still well last year, we had a, a true freshman team, right? A couple of them. But yeah, man, you're just getting numbers wherever you can, I suppose. Mixing yeah. your freshmen with the lower classes, strange, and the thinking because they're completely different campuses, like you said. The hard part of, yeah, so when I was at Amelia, we had eighth and ninth graders played JV. And unfortunately, we only had a handful of eighth graders because of the way that the hiring happened. I got hired when, basically, when the middle school was in their SOL testing or whatever it was. And they just, I couldn't get a time to go in and recruit the middle school. And looking back, I should have just gotten on the phone, called every middle school kid and you know that seeing it now it's like i should have just gotten on the phone and called him but the hard part of that and really only having we had a boatload of freshmen so it wasn't like we didn't have enough we had a really really good freshman class so it wasn't like we were short on athletes but we the the hardest part of that was because you have 51 players in the program 27 players on varsity but you have an injury or you have we didn't have very many injuries but you have things going on, kids mispractice, whatever reason I want. And and also we had a very small staff and I needed that JV coach. We got five guys between JV and varsity, right? Right. So the JV is going to practice with us. And then they would break off on Tuesday after, like I said, 90 minute practice plan. We're done at four. We start practice at three ten or something like that. So we're done at four forty. So that also allowed the JV to break off and go practice for 25 minutes on their own to run their stuff. But I would not allow, I did not want the eighth graders. I was fine with the eighth graders being involved in the indie because most of our indie is very low contact. I didn't. And, and occasionally I would get the eighth graders out there and I would pull all seniors off the field. And I would, I had a few juniors that just to make numbers so that they could have a scrimmage and we were there. You know, I didn't care if they were out there with sophomores, but if they're out there with, with juniors, um, I would tell those, I would put the juniors out there and tell them like, Hey, you're, Everybody else is full go. You are quick whistle, two hand touch. You know, especially, don't hit an eighth grader. Don't hit. Especially, I don't want. I don't need that. And but a lot of the time they could not participate. The other freshmen could be on our scout team, but I couldn't put the eighth graders out there and have my all region senior running back coming downhill at an eighth grader. Like that was the hard, and that was probably the worst part of it was that there was a period of practice every day where our eighth graders really couldn't do much. Um, And it only affected because of the way that we run practices. It didn't affect Monday because Monday was special teams. It only really affected Tuesday because on Wednesday, they were usually gone for JV, um, for JV games. So, because we played games on Wednesday. So, it really only affected Tuesday, but on Tuesday, I didn't like it. Yeah, we I've seen like 6th, 7th, 8th grade mixed together, which is... I think a pretty good. Mix. That's our normal right. middle school program. Yeah. Yeah. No one's hit puberty yet. So you're not 
Yeah. There's not, and there might be one kid shaving. Um, but there's usually, there's usually one eighth grader. Yeah. He was going to wreck shop anyway, no matter who he was with. And then I've seen, I don't know if it's out of Texas, obviously with Twitter being covered with football, uh, but I'm, I'm seeing a lot of freshmen, sophomore, like freshmen, freshmore. I don't know how they call it, but that's our normal like JV. Our, okay. That's, yeah. For so, us, that's our normal JV. So our normal JV, our, our normal middle school is six, seven, eight. Our JV is nine ten. Now we will pull up some eighth graders to JV. Our, our JV is nine ten primarily. Gotcha. Here and, uh, and then varsity is obviously senior junior that's never going to touch the field is just never going to touch the field. Like senior junior there. who's never going to touch the field is never going to touch the field. Correct. Right. And in Georgia, at least my school, it was we played JV. I played JV as a junior, and so <clears throat> that was so we played. We had freshman team and then sophomore junior was JV and primarily sophomores, but also some juniors. Cause I, I was not good enough. And um, not with those kids. And then so if, if you were a bad senior, you weren't going to play, but yeah. yeah, I know a lot of places have that where it's basically just an exhibition. So like with coaching wrestling here, when I coached wrestling, if we went to a JV tournament. It was just an exhibition tournament You could call it JV, but I've got a senior who just, you know, he's never wrestled before needs some mat work. Um, I can get him out there. Yeah. I think that's more what I've seen around here is the, if you're a 12th grader and you're not good at football, you're playing down. Really? You're, you can be on JV. It's just your non-starter. Yeah, it's so. just, it's w- exhibition is what it should be. And I don't know that there's like a law here. Right. Um, the only thing you have to pay attention to is your quarters limits. Eight, we have, we have eight quarters. I assume that's everybody, everywhere. No, <laughs> we have four quarters. Uh, when I was growing up in Georgia, we had five quarters. Uh, you get four quarters, period, here. So wow. so what if you go to now, overtime? Huh? You got to set everybody in overtime? Well, you can play overtime. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that okay. doesn't count. Yeah. But you, uh, you have four regulation quarters. So in other gotcha. words, if you play a half of JV, now what a lot of places will do is they'll count minutes. If you play the first half or you play the, say I need this kid to be on my special teams, but he's not going to start at linebacker. I'll let him play a half of JV and then he's going to be on all my special teams. He's right. not going to start on both of them. And the thing in Virginia is all of that stuff is self-policed. You can't, it's all self-policed. So it is not uncommon to roll up and nobody's going to get upset. We're going to play or we're going to dress. It's kind of like a suggestion. We're going to, we're going to take our JV kid that are varsity backups and they're going to play their JV game. And if somebody gets hurt, they're going to play the way that it's really worked. And I think this is the actual rules. You have 40 quarters of regulation. And so if the JV has a game canceled or if a kid misses a JV sits for a week of JV, or if we blow a team out on JV and he sits for the second half, he has two more quarters that he can now use on varsity Throughout the season. And so you kind of stack those up. And as you get later in the year, you could, you now you've got a, a backup that has plenty of minutes. You don't have to worry about him not getting JV time. Um, plenty of, excuse me, plenty of quarters. The minutes thing was actually, I think it was Marshall Parker, who's won a state championship by Hopewell uh, when I first started coaching. Um, and his son's the office coordinator there now. Um, it's Trevion Henderson's school. They, he would always talk about counting minutes. We got 48 minutes. So 180 minutes, this kid can play. Like if he doesn't play offense, he's stacking minutes that he can use on varsity. (laughs) It is not uncommon. It is not at all uncommon to play JV on Thursday, turn around and play varsity on Friday. And a lot of schools will only give the helmet stickers to the varsity kids and the JV kids won't get the helmet stickers. See eight guys over there with no helmet stickers on, like nobody's. But they're usually not playing, but they're not playing a lot, but they're there. We get eight quarters and that's like... Freshman and JV games, that's your eight quarters. And then I, you're not supposed to suit. Same thing. I, it's self-policed, but yeah. I guess you had a ringer and you were playing him freshman, JV, and varsity just to get him reps. Someone's probably going to snitch on you, so you better police it, it up. But we it's, it, we abide by it pretty well. Everywhere I've ever yeah. been, It's you get your eight quarters and you're done. And that's a lot of football. Anyway. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. I yeah, mean, so even at the lower level with eight or ten minute quarters or whatever, it's still, still a good amount of ball. The only time that it's come up is... Occasionally, you'll get a, let's say, a rivalry game, and you just want to win the JV game and get some momentum going in. And so you'll see, like, 
I I don't think we've ever done we the JV coaches always want to do this so maybe sometimes it happens but I don't but you'll we'll play a team and there's some kid that's just lighting it up and like he ain't a JV kid like on Friday he's starting but he right. just happens to be a really good freshman sophomore or something so that'd be fun <laughs> yeah we're Who playing him out of position right yeah Wait. <laughs> he's still it, got it actually, minutes. Yeah, everything we talk about does fall into what we're going to be discussing tonight. And it's just because we've discussed big school, small school, and all the things in between. Um, so episode tonight, if you've jumped on and you didn't read the title, it's all about defensive staff organization. We're going to be going over, regardless of what size school you're at, but we're really going to be talking about your coach staff side. And depending on how many coaches you have on staff, we're going to look at the defensive side alone tonight uh, and just talk about where you should have coaches, how you should have them divided up. Who should the corners coach have the safeties? Do you split it DBs and front seven? However that looks. So depending on how many coaches you have, but we'll jump into that as soon as you want to pay the bills, sir. I'm not sure what to pay uh, because I don't know where we're going to be at. Listen, we've got some new things coming along. Um, so I will just say, instead of those bills, I will say this, follow us and me and uh, you'll find out about these things. And so the places that you want to go that are actually now in existence we are on Twitter, uh, at Football Info, um, but on Instagram, clips of the podcast are going up every day, so you can keep up with the podcast. And so follow me on Instagram, at Joe Daniel Football, uh, and also on TikTok now. I'm up to, I think, four followers on TikTok. Uh, are they called followers? I don't think, I don't know. It, it was there. We're, just, we're posting the clips there, but then also, well, I don't do dances and stuff, but posting the clips of the podcast up there, um, along with a few other things, announcements and things will be going up as well as so follow us on TikTok at Joe Daniel football. Um, either one. I mean, it's going to be a lot of the same between the two. So pick the one that you really like to scroll when you're on the toilet. That'll be the one that you're going to want to see me on, <laughs> see Daniel on. There you go. I did see myself. I haven't touched Instagram in years and I had to log in the other day and see if it still was a thing. If it still worked and it did. And then there I was. I was a clip. Instagram's doing really well. We don't have a big, I don't have a big Instagram following because we never nurtured it. It's not as big as 20,000 people on Facebook. We got 13,000 or something on Twitter and or X and I think right. 16 or 17,000 on YouTube, um, which also the podcast, by the way, are on YouTube. You can go to joedanielfootball.com slash YouTube um, or just search YouTube for Joe Daniel Football uh, and you can watch the podcast. Um, if you're listening, if you're, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're like, why are they saying that? Is because for 12 years, this has been an audio only podcast. But now we are now with all of the uh, tools that are available to us, we are able to post the podcasts and clips of the podcast in all of these different places um, to check those out. But Instagram's actually, you know, we got like a thousand views on the last, last video that went up. So that's, I think that's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. Check them out. I'm, I'm a big time podcast watcher. I prefer to watch people have a conversation than just listen to it. Yeah. Um, obviously, that's not always available yeah, most of my podcast listening is in the car so yeah or if i'm like in the kitchen or something i turn on podcast and let's do it and go for a walk or whatever walking sweet we'll consider bills paid then go follow us on all the things um instagram i jumped on there as well at coach chambo okay the same as my twitter you, you can get on there and we actually have an athletic speed movement we do and i'd forgotten that we created that a long time ago and it's just been sitting there with nothing on it. I don't even know the follow. So you'll just have to look at Athletic Speed Movement and it'll pop up. I will have the tag by the yep. time that we... We are on TikTok with that as well. Great there you news. go. At Athletic Speed Movement. Hasn't done anything yet. Haven't... We got some plans though. We got plans. Big it's plans. Remember now, I know this probably... Come, I don't even January, know. Early January. January 4th. January 4th. I think yeah. is when this one comes out. So... 2024, uh, baby. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year to everyone. We forgot to do our pre-Christmas talk, huh? Oh, boy. It's fine. It's fine. It's all right. Sweet. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about staff organization. So Joe, first question is, uh, I know it depends on numbers and we're probably going to go through that quite a bit. Um, so what should your staff organization look like? The big key here is we talked about this on a recent episode on communication. And we talked about how one of the important things for you to do is to establish who coaches what so that we aren't stepping on each other's toes. Uh, it's not so much the coach's ego. It is kids should not be getting multiple messages. That's what right. creates confusion. Confused players play slow. They play soft. They play sloppy. They play scared. They are the four S's of coaching death. They are the things that get us fired. They are the things that shorten our lives. Soft, slow, sloppy, scared players are a coach killer. And so when you are coaching 
your defensive line group and someone else wants to pop in and keep telling the defensive lineman something different, he is in, a, in essence killing you. Uh, and so that is why I absolutely hate it. Um, I don't know why other coaches, it's just it's very frustrating. And, and it's one thing to occasionally step in, but it's another when it's just, um, I'll give you an example just that, that everybody knows. Uh, the kicker. <laughs> Assuming that you don't have a kicking coach who's a certified kicker coach. Right. You will have five coaches telling the kicker how to kick or to just kick the ball. And that is why the best thing that I've ever seen done in that situation is for the head coach to say, nobody talks to the kicker but me. That's the one that always works. But you have to enforce that. So that's why a position group is so important in separating your guys. So what we want to do is we want to establish as early as we can for multiple reasons. We want to establish what everybody's position group will be, what their focus will be. Uh, even if you're not practicing, even if you're uh, one of the states who's not allowed to you know, talk football with your kids until you know, season starts, uh, or if you're being freshman team and the eighth graders are at a different school and you aren't going to see them for God knows how long, uh, it doesn't matter. You need to be giving your coaches time to prepare to coach that position, to get their drills ready, to get to know where they fit in the system. Uh, and so we want to give our coaches, we want to have spe specific places for all of our coaches to be at. So obviously we want position groups. But then the other thing that we're going to really talk that's I think more as important as having position groups is we need to understand how everybody's going to work together. And we need to divide things up appropriately. And that's what we'll talk about tonight, today, whenever you listen to this. The, or watching. Or watching. The, um, this especially is important if you only have two, three, even four coaches, because you're going to have, you're going to be in a hybrid model at that point. And that's going to be a big part of this because there's not a clear way to divide the team up between three coaches. Uh, and, and there's not a clear way to divide the team up between two coaches. We've got ideas. We've got ways we can do it. But on the offensive side of the ball, the one that always comes up is the tight ends and the H-backs. I think that's why people like the spread is like, I don't have to deal with that crap. It's just you got receivers, linemen, quarterbacks, running backs. We've eliminated an entire position group. But if you have say four coaches, right? And you got, we got offensive line, we got receivers, we got running backs, we got quarterbacks and the tight ends are going to be a hybrid. So any of your hybrid type positions usually become the victim of this and they have to float and you've got to figure out that organization because they're going to be coached by multiple different coaches um, in multiple different areas. Uh, now, as you get into five, five's about that's your number for, okay, we got five groups and then Keep going you know, when you get into six. Now you're in a luxury situation where it, it's, it, and I say that coaches who are from bigger areas, if Daniel, if you've got a coach who's been in your division their entire life coaching career, they don't understand this because they've got freshman coaches and JV coaches and 22 guys on the sidelines on the varsity staff. Most of us coach, whether we have a situation, youth coaches are always looking at two or three coaches, right? And you got to coach both sides of the ball. Most of us coach in a place where we are lucky to have five. And if we have five, there's going to be times where the, that might be the whole five. That's varsity and JV. Right. And so they're going to be gone for one practice a week because you know, some position groups are going to be gone. I'm only going to have three. And now I've got to get figured out how to manage that situation. Uh, when I've only got three coaches one day. So there's a lot to this. You've just got to, you can't start to plan your practices. You, I would go as far as to say, you can't start to build your playbook until you know who's going to coach what. Because the fewer coaches, and this is important, you have to be honest with yourself, the fewer qualified coaches, everybody's not qualified yet. Hopefully they'll get there. And we have things like Football Coaching 101. That's a really a quick start, get them going, uh, but everybody's not there day one to be to just be cut loose and let them go. So I can't start worrying about 
installing pattern match coverage when I don't have a safe, a capable staff that's going to be able to coach that. Uh, I can't be putting in complex blitzes when I'm trying to get a defensive line coach who understands that we got to squeeze a down block. We talk about non-negotiables. Non-negotiables, each position has a non-negotiable. And what that means is that in your specific scheme, each position has something that is non-negotiable. You cannot play for us if you cannot do this. On the defensive line, squeeze a down block. At linebacker, it's following a puller. Because if he doesn't follow the puller, we are outnumbered. So it's forcing a change of direction at the safeties. It's staying over top at the corners, assuming you're zone co- coverage. It's disrupting the route if you're a press coverage. Uh, these are things that, that are non-negotiable. And um, if my position coach is new, I'm not going to be, let's say I got a new defensive line coach. I'm not positive he's going to be great at coaching the non-negotiable yet. So why am I worried about installing defensive line twists and stunts? Right. Because if we can't, if, if we can't squeeze a down block, none of that matters. You can't scheme your way into the non-negotiables. So that is what we, that is what we need to do to get this thing ready. I didn't realize there was such a vast difference in coaching staff sizes because Weirdly enough, every stop along my way, we've had a fairly decent coach. We had four at Wyandotte, which, like you said, you're lucky to have five generally, or, or most people are commonly have five. But it, th- that was a 118, 25 kids or something. So even with four, it split up okay. Uh, the issue there is it seemed like none of us knew what we were doing. None of us were ready, probably. Was, and then the rest of us were uh, just the guys that he got stuck with. Uh, including myself. I had zero. That's very, <laughs> yeah, that's very common is that you get a head coaching job and more and more common today, you get a head coaching job, but you don't get any positions to hire. Right. When I got hired, first of all, it was already May, but I was like, can I get a coach? And they were like, sure. Can you find a science teacher? I was like, Yeah. Like you're, you're one of the only science teacher football coaches I know. Right? Me? <laughs> yeah. Like where are you going to go find science? Yeah. It's, it's harder, right? Yeah. They're like, you got science or English. And I'm like, absolutely zero football coaches teach English. Yeah, so we ain't got time for all that. Yeah. There's like too much reading. And I'm like, I need a history or a PE like that. And I didn't get that. Uh, and so more and more common now you come in. You got a couple guys, like you said, you're stuck with because they're teachers in the building and then, and that's it. And then you're looking at some lay coaches, whoever you can get. And this is very, very common uh, for coaches to have a very small staff. And, and then of course, for those of you that are at the, are at the high school level, uh, look around at your other staffs and it's very common that your freshman staff might have, you know, or your JV staff or your JV staff or your freshman staff or your middle school staff is two or three guys, right? And we work with all those coaches. So in fresh and youth is always like one guy, two guys you know, trying to figure right. one guy and three dads who can make it once a week. Uh, and you're just piecing it together, trying to figure it out. So we have to have a plan within JDFB. You know, we have to have a plan for all of our coaches, whatever situation you are to be able to do it. Yeah. I've even seen quite a bit of differences in Owasso obviously is a, we're the top size school in the state of Oklahoma. Right across the border from me here, I'm a, I live way over by the Arkansas border, and there's a school that's the second largest division in Arkansas. And I, when I spoke to them, they have like seven coaches. I think yeah. we have 14, right? And those seven coaches are the freshman and eighth grade staff and JV. So it's like, if you're an administrator and you're listening, understand that we have this podcast right here. This episode is going to do well because coaches across the nation are hurting for coaches yeah, and it's and, just it's, and need to hire more coaches. It's really hard to get coaches now. And God, some of you are in situations where they, you can't hire lay coaches. Right. And that makes it really tough because you're not going to hire anybody you can coach. You know, you're not going to give me any jobs to hire somebody. Like, you're not giving me jobs to hire somebody. When you tell me to go find a math teacher, you can do science. I can do math, but we're pretty good. That's lapsed years ago, but like we're, it's pretty rare, right? Oh, you can go hire a math teacher. Oh, cool. You can't even hire a math teacher. You just want me to go find you a math teacher. And I got news for you. Probably not going to happen. Yeah. Math teachers aren't out there looking for jobs. I could walk in. If I got that 
certificate renewed, whatever I had to do. Math, you walk into a school and you just say, where's my classroom? You don't interview for jobs. That's not what works. You're not helping me with that. So you don't let me hire anybody. And then, so I got to get a lay coach, but that's not easy. Uh, I don't, I don't need, I don't need the unhinged dad. Although at least if he's on staff, maybe I can control him a little bit instead of listening to him. At least he's standing next to me instead of behind me. Legitimately but, hand out whistles to all the yelling fans. <laughs> yeah. Or stick him up in the press box. Yeah. It, so there's, yeah, there's not, a, it, it's hard to get enough coaches and to get qualified coaches. At one point I was, and I ended up filling out my staff and it worked out fine. Uh, but I was at one point, so I was desperately trying to find someone that could coach and a, a female English teacher who had no knowledge of football was like, I will help out. And I was like, give her a coaching stipend. If I don't find anybody else, give her a coaching stipend. And she's going to be the academic coordinator. She's going to, you know, she's going to be out there doing all the managerial roles so that the three of us that have ever coached a football game can be coaching football. I was like, I can offload everything that she can do. Uh, I ain't giving her a whistle. I don't have any problem with a female coach, but she didn't want to be a football coach. She just knew I needed people. And I was like, I can make it work. And of course, then I told her what the schedule was. She was less, I think she thought it was like the French club meets once a month in the morning. <laughs> I was like, we practice five days a week. We got games on Wednesday night, Friday night three days a week in the off season, the weight room Saturdays, we got seven on seven. We got to go to West Virginia for a tournament, taking a school bus out there. It's going to be six hours. You're going to have a great time. She's like, I don't think it's not for me. me, especially when I told her what stipend was because it wasn't much. It never is. You can't add the, what do they say? Never, ever look at your hourly pay as a coach. Oh, that'd be, well, and I'm at, uh, I'm at one of the highest, that I've been at, I'm mean, absolutely the highest uh, stipend at the school that I'm at now. My my assistant coach stipend was almost as much as my head coach stipend was at the previous stop. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about what this uh, breakdown should look like. So if it's what is the you talked about which one is you get luxury after six. When we start trying to pair these up, is there certain ones that absolutely have to be I guess if you have two coaches, you're just in group, right? You're just doing inside run seven on seven, like for your indie period, right? Like you just have to split them. Yes um, and no. Which the first thing is, and this is why a lot of the things we do at JDFB and our defensive systems are going to be really good for you guys that have very small staffs. Um, and whether it doesn't matter if it's youth, middle school, freshman, high varsity, whatever, V, semi pro, very common for you guys are semi pro. I talk to semi pro coaches and I talk to international coaches a lot. And the importance of you guys that are coaching adults to have this organized, I think is critical because the issue with adults is always getting them. I, if I could get semi-pro, semi-pro and international coaches that are coaching adults to do one thing, one thing only, it would be 90 minute practice plan. Because if an adult knows I am going to show up and we are going to work on my craft for 90 minutes and I'm going to get better twice a week. This is worth my time. I got a better chance of them figuring out how to set other life things aside for that 90 minutes than I do if they're going to come out and what I've seen a lot of semi-pro practices, which is meandering around for two hours and, and feeling like it's what I see is uh, semi-pro. I see guys trickle in at different times. And we start to get something going over here and we start to get something good. This isn't all semi-pro, but this is what I've seen in, in the ones that I've seen. I'm sure there's some that aren't like that, but the big, biggest thing you could do is organize your staff, organize your practices. You can't organize your practices unless your staff is organized so that I know exactly who's going to be here, who's going to be doing what we're going to get in. We're going to get it done. It's going to be great. You are going to get better. And then you are going to go home and go back to your life because you're an adult. You're not getting paid. Uh, and I understand that. That's the, if you have two, and you're right. Two, two is the, you can do it with one, but it's not ideal. Two, you need two just to run. Now, I can organize a practice where I can run the entire thing myself because of 
using the wristbands and stuff. I can run a scout team. I, I can run it all. I would film everything uh, because I need to have, and I wouldn't care about yelling at them during practice. I need to film it because I can't see everything. I and I want to know, I want those scout team guys to know that they are being seen no matter what. So if I'm running the, if it's first team defense against a scout offense, I want those scout guys to know that they are being seen, that if you are an offensive lineman on the scout team and you're running people over, it is seen and you are going to earn playing time. And that's rewarded here. Uh, and also, if you're going to go out there and jack around because there's only a couple coaches and there's not enough eyes to see everything, it is going to be seen. And it's going to be pointed out. And everybody's going to know that you are shortchanging our team. Um, it's, that's one of the biggest things that you have to do with a small staff is you have to manage not having enough eyes. That's one of the hardest things. But if you have two uh, on the defensive side of the ball, number one thing is everybody learns tackling and everybody defeats blocks with rip drill. Uh, so we would run two drills, rip drill, and we would run our tackling progressions. Everybody does them together. Or everybody, you can do defensive line and linebackers and then the back end. So your front six and your back end. Uh, if you're four two five, it would be your four defensive lineman group, groups and your two linebackers and then your safeties and corners. Uh, if you're, Same thing if you're 3-3. Three, three. That's how you would group those guys. So you would group the under, it's basically what we would do is group under the umbrella and out. So everybody's spill goes together. Uh, this works really, if I had to choose a group, this works really well with 3-3. Three, three. So if I, if I only had two coaches and I'm like, what should we run? It would either be four, two or three, three, because I don't have enough people to coach all of these different positions and make them complicated. But the beauty of it is the three, three, because of the three linebackers always blitzing, they have to know defensive line key reads because when they are blitzing, they become essentially a defensive lineman. If they go blitzing and they don't squeeze a down block, they get kicked out. Uh, and that's a big, big thing for them. If they do, go blitzing and they get a pass set, they've got to get into pass rush mode. And so my linebackers will not be bored of defensive line key read drills. And so then I can combine key read drills with guard read drills. I can basically combine those things together. And, and like you said, it's kind of like an umbrella or like an umbrella. It's like a inside outside type deal. My secondary, my, my outside linebackers or overhang safeties, whatever you want to call them, my free safety and my corners, they would be doing umbrella drill. Uh, they would be doing umbrella drill. They would be doing, I probably would not run press coverage because not having somebody to go work press coverage with them enough not to take the corners and work them specifically on it. So we would play cover three and cover one. And uh, all of our cover one drills for off cover one are just the same drills that we use for zone. And so you just turn the other way. All of our safeties use all of those drills. And so they would be doing our pedal drive, pedal break, pedal open. They would go pedal drive, pedal break, pedal open. Uh, they would do break in the basket, pass break up, PBU drills, pass break up, attack in the wrist. Uh, they would learn in phase and out of phase coverage so that we could play cover one. Uh, and then we would work our cover three stuff. Uh, and we would do our umbrella and we would work umbrella drill, which is, which that's going to be the primary, primary drill that we run. And they're going to do that all the time. And so with the three, three, that works out great. It fine with the four, two, I can still do key read drill and guard read drill together and it works out. Okay. It's just not as clean as the three, three. That's how we would break up two. And again, everybody uses rip drill. Now I don't care how many coaches I have. Everybody uses rip drill because where I coach, we're smaller than everybody else. And we don't need to be engaging anybody. We need to be getting off the blocks. And so everybody uses three man rip drill. Everybody uses tackle progression. And then we go through our core drills that are in our defensive drill system uh, with two. So when you have hybrids, we talked earlier about um, offensively, you can just scratch the H and Y position, mm -hmm. just go spread. Um, unfortunately, you can't do that on defense, right? You have to have that hybrid cat I guess if you yes were no. or he could just be the outside. But I guess that's, what I'm trying to say is three, 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 three and four, play, two. Yeah, the, they have to play coverage and they have to fit the run. And so you still end up with a guy that needs to go half the time with run fits and half the time he needs to be working. But we're going to be an umbrella drill. So that's all going to be taken care of. Touche. We're going to be an umbrella drill where we're getting ball up, ball down reach. Umbrella drill is our key read drill, essentially, but also there's the pass coverage aspect of it. If we get a ball up read, we're dropping to our spots or we're opening our hips. Then we're going to go seven on seven, or uh, and you can get creative with your practice times if you want to go seven on seven, uh, or we can just go team pass. 
just because we only have two coaches. But as we get into more coaches, we can go uh, send one guy down to work with the offensive defensive line. And then, when, and then but once we get to three, three is a very workable number now. At three, you go defensive line. If you're a four two, you go defense. I just, I'm not going to get into three four or four three because I don't think you should be doing that with two coaches. The majority of you that are going to have two coaches, you are coaching youth. And um, the majority that have two coaches are going to be coaching youth. There is no reason uh, on God's green earth that you should be running a four three or a three four. Right. I'll just go ahead and tell you if you're, if you are um, and it's working for you, fantastic. If it's not working for you, come see me. Because we can fix it. We can just go four two or three three. Make it real simple. Even the four two five at a youth level, like maybe you're just stacked with skill type players. But the four two five is it's so it's built around. I want athletic kids on the field anyway. Like you talk about all the time, like there's no offensive coordinator's worst nightmare is a bunch of single digits on the D. They're fast and they're strong and they're the oh the four two. The, the, your your and deciding you, factor between four two and three three, just for people who haven't heard this before, has absolutely nothing to do with the type of athletes that you have. None. We're going to put the best 11 on the field, period. The athletes that you have has zero impact. Everybody's like, well, we have a bunch of linebackers, so we're going to go 3-3. Three, three. At least if you have a bunch of linebacker guys, give yourself four linemen instead of three. If they're small, get four of them. Why, why, yeah. why, they're small. I only want three. What? Why? You're One of the things is, again, when you blitz guys in the 3-3, three, three, the blitzer becomes a defensive lineman. So whereas in the 4-2, those guys are always defensive linemen, so they're going to get better at doing that job. Those four, um, they're going to they're going to get better at that job. Yeah, we're going to put speed on the field. But all the the thing that decides what you should be running. Um, again, there are some external factors, number of staff and things like that, but it is what fits your personality as a play caller. What do you believe in? What can you teach? And there are some factors like. Is it four is is overkill in a lot of situations? I love the four three. If I got to recruit, if I got to go out and pick my players, if I was at a big school with studs everywhere, I very well might be in a four with coaches too. I might be in a four three, but I'm not. So I'm going to put preference towards uh, three three. I'll put preference with the four two, uh, and then either the three three or the three four. Probably as a change up would be where I would start. But that's me. If you're somebody who wants to keep it very simple. And you understand that, keep it simple so the kids can play fast, faster players, win more football games, confuse players, play slow, soft, sloppy, scared. And that's what kills football coaches. The four S's of coaching death. I don't want those. You want to be in a four, two. You know that you don't have a lot of guys on staff. You got three guys, four guys. They're not very experienced. You know that this is going to be a a tough year. You know that your kids uh, don't have quote unquote a football IQ. I couldn't care less about that. We got plenty of time to teach them this stuff because we don't have a lot to teach them. Uh, We're going to get out there in a four, two. And you're going to love four two because that's what you want. If you want to have more control over, uh, if you want to, you know, what a lot of coaches talk about is it's more disguised because you're always in a three three stack. But I can bring this guy here. I can bring this guy here. If you're somebody, what I always say is, if you're somebody who desperately wants to be a flavor of the week guy and say this week we should be in a five two and this week we should be in a three four and this week we should be in a four two and this week, then you should run a three three because you can create those fronts. Um, and that way your kids are always just running your 3-3 defense and you're keeping it very simple. But you can go in and come up with four different fronts that you want to run and put those into your game plan as blitzes. And then if you want to, if you're a tinkerer, if you know that you're going to go in there and you're going to mess with it and you're going to try to break it and you know you want to have a bunch of different looks and you know what you want to do different things, you should be in a 3-4 as your base. 3-4 becomes more complicated now because unlike the 3-3 and the 4-2, where, as you mentioned before, the force guys are always the force guys in your umbrella drill. As you go to the three, four, there are now four different guys who could be force, uh, two different guys who could be alley, two different guys who could be spill players, right? So any of our outside linebackers or our safeties could be force. Some of them are going to be more primary force and some of them are going to be more often forcing and more often coming off the edge and being your fourth rusher. But uh, that. And that creates an added level of potential confusion, soft, slow, sloppy play. Okay. So when you add that extra level, that can lead to confusion. And that's why you have to be ready for it. And then the fourth, uh, does you do have the ability to make the safeties always the force. It's not the way we've always done it. Um, but you do have the ability to make the safeties always the force, 
but the difference is they better be dudes. Um, the Mike linebacker better be a dude, and the three tech better be a dude. An iguana. An iguana, <clears throat> yes. And, so, and that is where, while the 4 3 is to me the most beautiful thing ever created and has incredible blitz angles, and I will install it as a secondary just to have the blitz angles, but we're always going to be rotating to a three under three deep. I, even though I think it is the most beautiful defense, you better have dudes and coaches because you, the, these things, it is a beautiful machine, but it has to operate right. It is a machine where if you have cracks in that machine, pieces that are not properly maintained, it will fall apart. Um, so that is the deciding factor. Which one of those appeals to you the most? And do you have the staff and the people, uh, the four, three being the only one that I really worry about the people, but the staff is a big factor for me. Got you. Sweet. We kind of ended up killing two questions there. Cause the second one is just, why is each scheme different? And you very yeah, well yeah. that down. So the last part here is just how do we decide what coach goes where? So we break out and I think we, we, can, we can get some more numbers if you want. To yeah. We get some more numbers. Cause I think we just broke down the, if you got two coaches, you're correct. Yeah. So let's, so now we've got three coaches. How do we break them? Well, now we go, Probably defensive line, linebackers, secondary. Uh, and I, I've done this, and it's perfectly doable. I was the secondary coach. And it's not, again, you break down the secondary the way that we just talked about. We're doing umbrella drill. We're doing our pedal drive, pedal open. We, the defensive drill system is part of JDFP Premium Coaching Systems. And it's got the, the drills that we do. They're all there. We do those same drills all season long. The drills are familiar. They're understood. We get there. We get, if you're going to, if you're going to be a fast paced practice, you can't spend time installing new drills every day. Plus they won't translate to the field. These are the drills that do the things that we must do to be successful. If we can do these four or five things, we will be a good football team. Um, and those drills are mostly focused on, I say key reads, but what they're really focused on, they're all primarily focused on triggers. Now, this is except for uh, your prep tackling progression and your rip drill. Um, and we'll do some other tackling stuff as well. Your tackling work and your block destruction, rip drill. Uh, but within the position groups, we're looking at drills that work triggers. So that can be a key read if you're a linebacker, if he pulls, follow, if he doesn't fill. Then we're working on tracking the uh, the back, which is our secondary key. So in that out drill, um, we're working on our pass drops, uh, which are triggered by a pass read, which is a late read for our linebackers until they are much, much more experienced. Uh, but they get there late, but they get they got to get there. For our defensive line, it's a defensive line key read drill. All they do, down block, base block, reach block, pass block, screen retrace. Down block, and just, that's what they do. And until they master the down block, I get coaches all the time um, it's coming in with game film analysis as part of our platinum level. And those coaches will send their film for the first time, and I will tell them, your defensive linemen are not squeezing down blocks. You cannot play that way. If your defensive line coach needs to go in and he needs to do nothing but defensive line key read drill, and he needs to do nothing but down block and base block, and that is all that he will work all week, and he will do two, two down blocks for every base block, a two-to-one ratio, down block, down block, base block, down block, base block, down block. And we're, just, and we're going to work it, and we're going to do it, and we're going to do it, and we're going to do it, and we're not going to worry about anything else other than tackling progression and rip drill. That is all that we're going to work. Because we cannot win if we cannot do that. And same thing with linebackers, following, getting the alignment right. It's, uh, you do those drills that are non-negotiables. Three is perfectly workable. Uh, in secondary, we're doing, our, we're doing our triggers, which is um, pedal drive, pedal break, pedal open. Those are all triggered. Those are all in coverage. Uh, and they're triggered by the three-step key read on the quarterback, uh, or they can be triggered in man coverage by the receiver route uh, because of our eyes. But And then we're doing umbrella drill. Umbrella drill, so much. Um, pass breakup is triggered by the hands going up. You see the receiver's hands go up, you attack the wrist. So that's, how we, that's how we trigger that one. So it's all, all trigger work in your individual groups. We have four that we're at now. We're at four. Yeah, four starts to get... So here's one thing. I think that four is where you can actually run a three, four. And, and I'll get into that. I think if you only have three, it's very difficult because of your hybrid positions. It's going to be really hard because you're going to have, it's, you start, it's really, really difficult if you have less than four. But if you have four, you can work 
um, you know, your defensive linemen, you can work your linebackers, you can work your secondary, and then your overhanging safeties. Or what I would probably do is I would have a corners coach, and then I would have a safeties coach, and the OLBs would become hybrids. Uh, they would spend time with the defensive line, not the linebackers. I would not send them with the linebackers. I would send them with the defensive line or the safeties because they are either blitzing or forcing and pass dropping. So they have no role with the linebackers. They are never linebackers. They are, we can call them that. That's fine. But their role is either defensive linemen where they need to squeeze a down block or they are force flat, whatever your coverage is. So that's how I would organize it with, with four in your four, two, five and your three, three, you're now at the sweet spot, which is I'm going to have a defensive line coach, a linebackers coach, a safeties coach, and a corners coach. If I'm at the four, three, I'm going to have a defensive line coach, a linebackers coach, a safeties coach, and a corners coach as well. And then as you get into five, five now gets very good. If you have five guys on staff, that's a good number. So with your four, two, five, what I would do if you trust your coaches, if you don't, so there's two situations here. If you have four guys that you can trust as the coordinator, I would be the free safety coach because he is the most important in your defense. Uh, and so I'm going to be, I'm going to be with those free safeties. Now that allows me, there's still a safety. They're still going to umbrella drill. That allows me to go do head coach things or, or coordinator things. That allows me to float to the other position groups. That allows me to do some different things, but and you could also do this with your head coach and organize it that way. But it allows me to take that free safety who is the most important person in that defense, and he is the leader of that defense in an ideal world, uh, and focus in on him. And so I would have defensive line, linebackers, overhang safeties, free safety, corners. Uh, and the free safety would be handled by the coordinator or the head coach. If I'm in a – that's a 3-3 three, three or a 4-2. If I'm in a 3-4, now that fifth guy becomes the outside backers coach. And so I have D-line, linebackers, inside backers, outside backers. I know people who have done – I know people who have done a 3-5, and they, they coach all five. And that just doesn't make sense to me. If it's working for you, that's great. It doesn't make sense to me because the two outside guys are forced and the three inside guys are spill. And I want to be grouped more. I would never coach – I would never have the linebackers coach be responsible for the inside and outside linebackers. It's two different, yeah. two different positions. Very not only by name, but again, the role of the outside linebacker in the three four is not one of an inside linebacker. It is one of either a, either a defensive lineman or a safety in our system, um, yeah. and so that wouldn't make sense to me. It just, it just wouldn't. So I would have a defensive line linebackers, inside linebackers, outside linebackers, safeties, and corners coaches. Yeah, four three. Uh, well, let me back up real quick. If you don't trust one of those guys and you got five, you can make them defensive tackles and defensive ends coaches, and that way maybe you've got one coach at defensive line that you trust and one that you don't. Um, and when I say trust, I just mean to let them go off on their own. They don't have the experience. Hopefully you don't have a coach that you just can't trust. You, you don't know what's going to happen there uh, because they don't have the experience or something, and um, you just you don't want to give that up. Or if you're uh, – if you don't have anybody that this can also be a situation, you may have five coaches, but you're the only one who really gets it. You should coach the safeties period. They are the most important in your four, two and your three, three. Uh, they are critical and probably in everything because they're the force guys. I would probably coach the safeties in every group because that's you're handling the most important thing, which is the force and alley. And if we can get good force and good alley, then we can get these guys inside squeezing a down block and following pullers, and now we got something. We got something to work right. with. Four three, I would go corners, safeties, defensive line. Great thing about the four three is that everybody plays. I should back up in the four two. One of the great things about having two defensive line coaches, and this is where you go if you have six in the four two, is you make one of them a defensive ends coach because the six tech strong end has a very unique job when you play against teams with tight ends. So he needs some personal attention uh, to get good at that position. The 4-3, everybody plays primarily in an outside shade. And by the way, you'll also use your, if you use a lot of G front, you can use that guy to work your 2-I 
and your six eye defensive line and your uh, inside shade of the guard. So working from an inside shade. If you don't, then you've got to coach inside shade and outside shade. Um, and then you've also got to coach your slant tech if you're going to use any of that. So it just adds. But the four three is almost all played from an outside shade because it is a spill it and kill it focused defense. Everybody's an outside shade. Everybody's a tilt. Uh, the defensive line is the simplest, but it's got to be done. You cannot be. You have one job, but you better not. You better do it. <laughs> you better do it. Uh, so I would probably there go safeties, corners, defensive line. I would probably have outside linebackers and inside linebacker with five. And then as I get to six, now we start to break things up. I would have, uh, as I already said in the four two, I would have an extra defensive line coach. I would have a safety, a free safety coach, an overhang safeties coach, two defensive line coaches. Three three, it would be. I don't, I don't, three, three, I don't know how I would break that up. It probably depend on what type of people I got with six, because I, I might go inside linebacker, I might go Mike linebacker and stack linebackers or something like that. I've never had six with a three, three. If I were in a three, four, same, how do I break those guys up? Where do I need the help? It gets even harder because it's like, okay, I got corners. I got two safeties. I got, where do we need the, the extra guy? Where can he help us? And then. Obviously, you have th- every position group has two guys, except for the defensive line has three. So that might be just a numbers thing for you. I'm assuming if you got six coaches, you got more than 27 kids on your team. You might need a little crowd control. And then in uh, four three, I would have safeties. I'd have been two defensive line coaches. I would have uh, two defensive line coaches, two linebacker coaches, safeties and corners. Yeah. The only thing I really can see being different here is if you're a field and boundary team instead of a. Sh- Strong and weak. Tight end, yeah. Strong and weak, yeah. So you might start pairing some of those together just because those kids are going to spend sure. time together, right? So maybe I want my uh, filled corner and filled safety and maybe even that filled overhang together. If I'm, I got three coaches, the front five or six or whatever are going to be a coach. And then I might split filled and boundary and just let those kids work in unison. That way, if I'm already short staffed, the last thing I need is my corners coach to be looking at both sidelines at the same time in a game and he can't. So right. now at least he can watch, Hey, I'm the boundaries coach. So I'm watching my corner get toasted in cover three. And also yep. my guy was the post safety in that defense and also let that run wild. So it was his fault and he was looking to coach that. The only thing that I would do with that, the only thing I would say with that is in game, you really want to give the far side of the field to somebody up in the press box. Right. So that's where, because obviously the far side of the field is going to switch up sides. And I want somebody, I want the guy in the press box to be able to see the far side of the field clearly. If you don't have anybody in the press box, then you can put somebody, you, you can do what I do, which is stand 30 yards the opposite end, and then I can see the far side. I, I just like to be able to see from behind what's happening. I, it's, it's a better view for me. I prefer to be up top, but if we don't have the, if I have to be down on the field, then I will just stand farther away, and the, which is really hard when I'm the coordinator. I get a lot of steps. Call it, run down 30 yards, watch the play, run back, call it. Uh, and I've done it. And it's a lot of fun. Get a lot of, get a lot of work and get a lot of steps in for that. Yeah, if you're field and boundary, I could see that pattern match is where I would see that being. If you're a big pattern match team, I would see that being a much bigger deal. There are times where when we talk about drills, if you're going to do inside drills and outside drills, I've tended to get away from those. And we just do nine, nine versus nine run, team run. And then we go, we do seven on seven, nine v nine team. Right. That's it. Um, and now team will be broken up with sections of the practice sections of a team will be focused on screens play actions or this is inside run plays but we're in team uh, and i prefer to group those because that lets us work on things rather than just calling random plays i think if you're calling random plays in your practice that really screws you up uh, and i prefer to script everything i prefer to script the from an offensive standpoint i prefer to script the offense i prefer to script the defense from a defensive standpoint i would script the offense what you want to see because if you don't defensive coordinator script your scout team offense guy, nobody's ever scripted me. Whenever I've been offensive coordinator, I always run the offensive scout team. Nobody ever scripts me, and I will try to beat you. I just will. 
if you don't script them, they're going to try to beat you. Yeah. They're going to see an issue and they're going to run stuff and go, ha, I knew it wasn't going to work. And you're standing back there going, I'm trying to get something done. I don't know what you're trying to get done. And so when you, if you script it, you can get the things done that you need to get done. That will also, by the way, with smaller numbers of coaches, you need to spend more time in prep by having everybody scripted. Everybody knows where to look, right? I'm standing over here. I'm watching the backside corner and you run ISO. Well, there's only two of us. One of us wasn't looking there. He's watching a kid halfway, half doing a stock block, right. something like that. So you need to, you should be the more, the fewer coaches you have, the more scripted, uh, especially when you're talking to three, two coaches, three coaches, and you've got guys that have got to move between different groups. You better have it scripted at, at 345, the outside linebackers need to be here so that we're doing this drill. And some, if you don't script those guys, they get lost. Um, they get lost very quickly. The, and then you script, you script your practice, uh, you script your, you, you schedule your practice, and then you script your team run, team pass. It doesn't take that long to script it. And look, you script out your week based on what you want to do. Usually what I'll do is I script out the week based on my game plan. I script out the practice plays that I want to run based on the game plan on Tuesday. Uh, and I would make a plan. Hey, Tuesday is going to be run heavy. Uh, Wednesday is going to be pa more passing. Uh, and then maybe I'll always have a little squish area for something that we need to work on. But you definitely need to do all that. So the smaller numbers you have, the more effort has to be put into detail. Also, this is a great place. We're talking about scripting how to get this done now. And half line is is definitely very viable when you're short on coaches and you can't watch both sides. I spent that time with University of Tulsa this summer just watching theirs and they're going half line with all their dude. When I talked to Coach Wilson, the head coach there, um, you know, he basically said he never runs a gap scheme play in team because there's just too many big boys' legs down there and he's gonna tear a knee unnecessarily. So he will run all of his gap scheme stuff at half line. Yeah. And then that's beneficial to anybody. And that's, he obviously is not hurting for coaches. <laughs> well, those guys are coach Franks has been on here a couple times and he's the safeties coach at the university of Tulsa now. And he still has to watch a guy on each side of the field. So going back to that half line allows him to watch one dude at a time and fully coach that kid on every rep he runs. He never wastes a rep with a player because his eyes are right. on his guy. Same for the corners coach, outside backers coach, inside. It just fits. When, when you start trying to figure out how you want to run your practice and you are breaking down positions. I know I said field and boundary earlier, but it's absolutely okay just to go half line and just coach the crap kids. Uh, and then on game night, maybe, yeah, you might miss something, but maybe you split it. Like you said, near side, far side. I don't care whose kid it is, who the hell blew. Yeah, the and if you're the, if you're the, the, hopefully if you're the boundary safety corner coach, you also know what the field safety corner coach is supposed to do, uh, or or what they're supposed yeah. to do. Uh, you're not that specialized. How do they set the the half line? Do you know? Yeah. So just going off memory, he's got his full team there. They're lined up like they're about to run team, and then just they run one half and then run the other, and they always run it on a hash so that they get a field and boundary look for the defense. That way the defense is never confused about what's the field and boundary. And all that's just, they're going fast. Their offense runs, from what I understood, now I didn't get to sit down and talk offense. I did with defense more, but so they're still running plays that are field and boundary based. So if they come out and go quick game, it might be quick game field is always to the field side. Um, so their formations might align that way. Uh, we did talk for a little while about uh, because he's he's running run plays in there too, right? And he's only half line, and so essentially he just tells the running backs, even if it's inside zone, don't cut it back. You're not cutting back the center because I'm not running that guard. And when I ask, well, but if you're you know, in power, you got to pull the guard at least. Well, so I asked about how do you simulate that, and he was like, we just would tell that defensive end you're kicked out. As soon as I add a guard, the defense wants to add a backside backer, right? And then as soon as he adds a backside backer, I have to add a tackle that's going to go get him or, for a zone play or something like that. And now all of a sudden I'm back at team. And so he, 
I w- it, it made sense. There was some stuff that, yeah, it, it can get confusing, but you make it work to keep your kids safe. Yeah, I would probably keep the backside guard and the backside linebacker in a lot of situations because I do want that front side pull look. But what I would do is I would use our use the wristbands and then I would have it in there dead. Right. This everybody here's everybody that I need playing this play. So yeah. I need the backside linebacker to be involved because my tight end's responsible for blocking him. Right. Yeah. I need the backside, I need the backside puller to get there. I don't need the backside end. I don't need the backside tackle. I don't need the uh, backside safety. I don't need the backside corner receiver, whatever. You know, and I, do I need the other receiver there? I probably, I don't want him dead on every run play, but you know, what's his, depending on what's called for him, uh, if it's an RPO or something. So I can, ju- I would just put on their wristbands dead. Uh, other receiver yeah. there. If you have whatever. Um, can take out the backside tackle and the backside end. So we're down to 16 kids that we have yep. to run your practice. Uh, I can take out the backside overhang safety. So we're down to 15 kids that you have to run a practice. And they wouldn't even run the backside like safe. But they're a too high. That, they're too high. Right. Yeah. If you, yes, absolutely. And they wouldn't run. And he even admitted, uh, Coach Wilson talked about his quarterbacks will hang a ball out over the middle because all oh, my receivers open the post safety's not out there. So of course right. you got to hit that. Um, so he admitted there was flaws and I but- would feel, I would focus my run game there. If I was too high pattern match, I would do a lot of split field half field seven on seven Yeah, is how I would manage that. I would spend a lot more time with half field seven on seven. Um, to work my passing game. And then I would do team. Pass. I, I mean, you still have, had team pass. Period. Yeah. He's still, yeah I would do, I would do a lot more team pass, but I do like that idea of just having a few less. Um, what I liked about it, we did a lot of half line a few years ago. And the thing that we did was because we were a heavy inside zone team. And that was our third down drill. Third and three drill, third and two is all third and three, third and two, third and one. And we explained to them, on third and three, third and two, third and one, there is no cutback. Right. You are going to get, and we went out and we ran inside zone over and over and over again. No cutback, half line. You are going to cram it into a seam on the front side and get three yards and you better fall forward. I do remember, and Coach Wilson, if you happen to be listening to this podcast, or Dom, and I'm screwing any of this up, by all means, come on and correct us because we would love to have you on and uh, and you could teach us about your half line. But, you know, they would run inside zone, front side with no cutback. And then yeah. the very next snap is the other half of the field is going. So the boundary, you know, maybe it's filled inside zone to the field. Uh, and then the very next snap, the next running back is hitting the cutback. He still has to go through his steps for timing anyways. Um, and so now I'm working my center and then the two of the guard and tackle that would have been backside. So you still get the reps. You just have less people all at once and less you can save their own injuries. And what I liked about it is those skill guys on the outside aren't sprinting unnecessarily on. It, it would be like running inside zone or inside run period and having receivers go out there and just go block every time. Like it doesn't make sense sometimes. Right. right. So you get to cut that off. You cut their reps in half. Why run my star receiver? 20 plays in 20 minutes when he can run 10 or eight or six. And the more you get into conserve your kids and let them run wild on Friday night and quit destroying their legs on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the more that makes sense. The, that's what I like about the split field. If when we've been pattern match, I like the split field seven on seven because I can run my receivers and my secondary over here. And then the only guy who doesn't have to run back with the football is the quarterback. So I just have another football while that ball's coming back and those guys are getting lined back up. We're running the same concept over here. You know, we'd call one play. We go out there. Hey, we're going to run a curl flat. Everybody lines up or we wristband them and we run it here. Quarterback, bam, throws the ball. Now we go here. Quarterback, boom, throws the ball. 
quarterback just has to know, look, um, use your backup quarterback if you can, because you want a quarterback. First of all, you don't want torching your starters, but because <laughs> they're going to feel bad, but also he's, he's not going through his typical progression reads, right? He's just throw the ball in there somewhere. Fine. I do want you to read it, but there's, again, there's no backside read. Yeah. And that was, that seemed really neat too, about the way coach Wilson did. And I know we've changed directions here and we'll get back to the, how to organize your coaching staff, but I think we're done. Um, with that. Oh, okay, cool. Um, but when you start running concepts, when you start running Y cross, yeah, I focus on having to hit my front side too. And then the very next snap I'm rolling out to a side with all the D line is dead anyway, but, or maybe if you're going to throw it on three steps or whatever, but now he can take his three steps, hit his bounce step, reset his feet, and he has to hit the backside curl or he has to hit that drag. And so it, it just forces it to hit all those routes. It forces the quarterbacks to see more of the field by using less of the field, which is pretty neat. Cool. Um, last part here before we close out. How do we decide what coach goes where? Well, we've kind of talked about that as we went through it. What we're really concerned about is um, there's a few things that we're – the number one thing is where I put my good coaches and where do I put my new coaches that I don't quite trust yet. And we try to hedge it so that we get those guys. Like if I was looking at, again, the non-negotiables, I think most guys think still, most coaches still think, and I get emails about it, that the best coach needs to be the linebacker's coach. And I fully disagree. 100%. I think that there are two I'm things – there are two things that must happen. Your defensive line must squeeze a down block. Your defensive line must key read. And I think what we've typically done is put the um, put the least experienced coach a lot of times either at defensive line or with the corners because a lot of us don't see a lot of passing. I'd rather have, like, say, the head coach with the defensive line because he like his life's on the line with it. Right? He's the one that if, if those kids are confused, he's the one getting the coaching death. So – he ain't going to let him go out there and run up the field, line up sloppy. I want the safeties coach to be the best, usually the coordinator, but that's the most important. Again, if I can jar everything up and I can force an alley, I, can, I got six guys under the umbrella running around. <clears throat> they can make the tackle if I can keep it in there. If I can bottle everybody up inside, don't let them get outside, give up those big plays. And then again, if I have my defensive line doing what they're supposed to do, uh, and I'll put a couple of good kids at linebacker and we're going to be good. So I would say most detail oriented guy, the, there's the guy that you can say, listen, you have five things that you must do and be complicated, but you must teach these guys how to squeeze a down block, beat a base block, beat a reach block, pass rush on a pass read. And screen retrace. If they can do five, if they can do those five things, we're going to win a lot of football games. So I have one guy who's who is able to go down there and just do that, and he's cool with being brutally focused on that. By the way, it is not boring. I've been that guy. I was never bored. I was never bored. Okay, it's work, and you just keep and better and better. You th those of you who think that that sounds boring or like they're going to be bored at practice, like you you're not coaching enough. You're coaching every little nuance of this. Talk to somebody who is in a um, something that outwardly seems very simple, and, and talk to somebody who's really into it. Like anything that you really are into, you can get super nuanced with, right? Fishing, right? What's fishing? I throw a line out, wait for the fish. You talk to somebody who fish who's a fisherman, right? Seven rods. Everyone, everyone, I'm set up. I think like, we've had that talk on here yeah. before about the set, the full setup you're supposed to have. Yeah, the one you're supposed to have. I do not have that. I have two rods. Need a new reel, though. I got, got a gift card here. I got to go spend. Yeah. The if somebody who's into something like it is ultra deep. Um, I mean, you can look at it like a really simple video game. Look at like Mario, Super Mario Brothers, right? The original. Really, really simple. There are dudes whose entire life is speed running that game right and they know every little pixel perfect pixel, jump yeah. everything that's you defensive line coach you are speed super mario brother speed runner it's always going to be the same game every single time it's the same game since you were five years old since i was five years old but it's 
you are going to get, it's always going to be the same drill, but you are going to get ultra nuanced with it. That's your defensive line coach. The guy who knows the system the best and the guy who has the most, generally the coordinator, should probably be the safeties coach. The corners coach can depend. Are you going to be doing press man? Then you need somebody who's going to be detail-oriented on press man. If you're going to be doing off, it's going to be very much like the defensive line coach. I need you to go out. A lot of times with the corners, they have they are the ones who will fall asleep during the game, right? You go and you play the wing T team. We're going to have 19 snaps and then all of a sudden a run game. And then all of a sudden you fall asleep and ball goes over your head for 65 yards with a kid who can barely shot with the ball 20. And we can't have that. So he's got to learn how to do things. And so I need a coach who's going to be on top of it, very much like the defensive line coach. And then my linebackers coach, again, has got to be very, very detail oriented on if he pulls follow, if he doesn't fill. You know, a lot of times, I love it if I can find a linebacker. One of the things about linebackers is if you can find the kid, we don't always have this kid, but if you got a kid who's got instincts, leave him alone. Leave him alone. He's going to run your drills, but just leave him alone. If you are in the 4-3, I, I, and I do want a linebacker. So here's let me back up on the linebacker coach. I also can't have a slappy at the linebacker coach because what the linebackers have to know, they, it's not – the defensive line doesn't have to know anything about tendencies and stuff. They can't. I mean, they, it's helpful. But the linebackers have got to know tendency situation, tendencies, formation adjustments. So they have a lot of work in that regard that the defensive line doesn't. Again, the defensive line is just down there kicking butt, squeezing down blocks all day. The linebackers have a lot more mental work. The safeties have a lot of mental work. The corners have more drills, especially if you're running two different coverages. Uh, they have more things to work if they're going to go press man and off man um, or, or press man and off zone. But, you know, so there's more drills, but again, I got to have them focus. Where, where we put those guys, I think the big thing is the guy who is not going to allow, the guy who's the most knowledgeable in the defense should probably be coaching the safeties. The guy who is not going to allow uh, any slip in the detail and he's going to coach those five Read and react, key read drill is defensive line coach. Not that I, there's nowhere where I'm like, here's where I put the terrible coach. But the linebacker coach, if I can get a linebacker coach who will run those drills in, in at out drill and guard read drill and then work his zone drops and his man drops and that kind of stuff, the linebackers are, I, as the coordinator, I can work on that mental game off the field or in team or in because the linebackers are always going to be one of the things is the linebackers are never gone. They're in seven on seven. They're in team run. They're in they're They are at the center. The defensive line goes off. The corners go off. Maybe the safeties in some situations, but the defense, but the linebackers are always there wherever the coordinator is. Cause coordinators probably run seven on seven. He's running team run. He's running, uh, or he's running 99. He's running team. He's running half line, whatever it is. He's there. So the line, I'm going to see the linebackers a lot. I'm going to know what's going on with them. If you have a coach that you absolutely trust, the practice plan is just a suggestion. My practice plan is just a suggestion. When I'm not the coordinator and I get a practice plan, it's just a suggestion. I know what we need to do. This is my group. I'm going to do it my way, which I have already cleared ahead of time. Right? I'm not just going to go it's out there. Coaching. <laughs> yeah, but we've discussed what needs to be done. I have told you how I want to do it. You have said that is fine, or we have made adjustments to make it fine, and I'm going to go out there and do this. And, and I've earned that from my head coach. Um, and my head coach, when I give him a practice plan and I'm the coordinator and he goes down to coach's position group, it's just a suggestion because he's the head coach. Right. But if that is not the case, I'm scripting the practice plan. These are the drills that need to be done. You need to go do this. If I have somebody who's a 20-year 20, 20 veteran defensive line coach who I trust, I'm going to tell him what needs to get done, and he's going to get it done the way that he thinks it needs to get done. Then if it's not getting done, we're going to go pull my drills out. Right? That, but starting off, you've got trust. Absolutely. I think we checked all the boxes, man. We crushed it. Agreed. You thought we could do offense and defense. Yeah. Look, you're right. I was wrong. Yeah, no. You're always right, Joe.
you want to pay the bills here again, like and then we will uh, episodes. We'll jump out. Seven hundred episodes. Yeah, I forgot the episode count. I think it's over seven hundred now. I think I'm over a hundred and something now. It's pretty. Yeah, awesome. probably. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Because you've been four or five seasons. So yeah, yeah definitely. JDFP Premium Coaching Systems. Check it out. Go to. I'll talk about. Actually, let's just do the social media because I do want you to check out JDFP. Um, if you go to JoeDanielFootball.com. Uh, you can get the podcast there. You can see the YouTube videos there. Uh, you can check out JDFP Premium Coaching Systems there. But today is all about the social medias. That's right. So 2024. Find, yep. We've turned a new leaf. We're going to socialize. Yeah. So the- find us on Twitter at Football Info is me. Daniel do his stuff in a minute. You can find me on or find us on at Joe Daniel Football on Instagram at Joe Daniel Football on TikTok. And the YouTube channel is Joe Daniel Football on YouTube, which is where you can watch these podcasts if you are in listening format right now. Um, you can watch them as well. They are uploaded the Tuesday. They come out on Thursday in audio. So if you're a YouTube listener and you can't wait for the next episode, get it on audio. It'll be out in a couple of days. And you can get it in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, and you can also get it on the website at joedanielfootball.com. Uh, but you can check us out on YouTube. You can go to joedanielfootball.com slash YouTube, and that'll take you to the channel. We have a wonky actual YouTube address. so It is what it is. Yeah. YouTube doesn't. Google's not about letting you change things after you first start it. I am on X and Instagram at Coach Chambo OK. Uh, you can also email me at Chamberlain Football Consulting at gmail.com. I do not TikTok, so I'm afraid of it. The Chinese. That too. And then the government was like, you can't use it on government property. And so oh, yeah. at school, it's banned. And I'm, I work for the government everywhere. Yep. Yeah. I just stay away from TikTok. It's better. But mainly because I don't Ron know. told us that like the minimum or the average time it's open is an hour. That's scary. I already spent too much time on Twitter. Oh, no, no look, I, I, I had, had another one. back in 2020, I had TikTok and I was spending, granted, the, the, that time of life where we were stuck, not a lot to go to, but I was spending a lot of time for several months. I was on TikTok a lot and I was just yeah. like, I got to delete this. Uh, and of course, everybody else figured that out. And so now I got Instagram with the reels. Uh, but it's a little bit, it's more stuff to do now. Shorts and reels and Facebook stories and as a TikTok now. Everybody's got it on there. Yeah, I get on the YouTube shorts sometimes too. It's, yeah. so I watch different things in each place, which is funny. So the TikTok All your was, algorithms are different. Yeah, TikTok was TikTok was insistent on a couple of things that I was just like, I, it's not what I want to watch. Yeah. But they were like, Yeah, you do. Sorry. The podcast is at the FBCP on X slash Twitter. If this is your first time listening to the Football Coaching Podcast, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. You can find us on your favorite podcatcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Pods, like Joe said. Um, wherever it is you go to get your podcast, please leave us a review if you've been listening for a while, or even if it's your first time stopping by. If you're watching us on YouTube, leave a comment and tell us it's your first time. But we'd love the, uh, the five-star review if you can give us one. If not, let us know what we're doing wrong, unless it's you're just going to tell us we're talking on a podcast because we know. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football Coaching Podcast. Remember, coach simple, play fast, win.